All right, this is No Excuses with Michael D. Leonardo. I'm your host, RJ Roger. My friend, my partner, my brother, my mentor to a certain extent. Uh, and now you're chef. And now you're chef. Guy that gives me a lot of advice. Michael, how you doing? <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great intro. I appreciate that. And the sentiments go to both ways. So you. Well, you give them to me, it's the same way back to you, brother. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you. You know, I always tell you, every time I see you, I'm going to tell you again. You know what I'm going to say? I love you, brother. I oh, love I, you, brother. <laughs> for that one. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me that you hang on words. Remember, you always tell me you hang on words. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's bad. But you've caught me in a lot of hanging on words. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot. I got, RJ. I got that bullseye not on the back. It's on the front. <laughs> RJ, you told me. Bullseye on the back is cheating, bro. <laughs> RJ, this is exactly what you said. So what happened? <laughs> what? <laughs> so you do hang on words. I give you that. Yes. I'm gonna, so I'm going to test you. Yeah, all right. We were on the phone about hour and a half ago, we were talking about something I had to buy to put our cooking show out. We were having some technical problems. And you didn't know what it was. But I told you the name of it, and, and I described it. This is what it is. Now, uh, what is this called? That's called a, uh, a, uh, a fornicator. <laughs> a hard drive. Oh, no, I, I thought it was a fornicator. I knew I was going to catch you. <laughs> you didn't hang on my words this time. <laughs> well, Extra you know what? hard drive. <laughs> you know what? And, and shame on me. I just, with this computer stuff and this technical world, I just don't grasp it. I just, I, maybe it's just something I just block out and I say, leave it for the young people like yourself to, to, to explain me, as we say. <laughs> you explain me. <laughs> Um, so interesting. We're going to have a show that you don't even know what I'm going to ask you here. So, um, you're going to be hit off guard here. You thought we were talking about Atlanta trial, but we're not. <laughs> so, um, well, so we, we, what about that? Uh, the girl Mossy, did she get a heads up that she was going to be able to maybe come on? So if she comes on, we have to indulge her now. Well, the thing is, she didn't get back to me. So I, oh. that's, that's why I called an audible. <laughs> okay. right. so, um, so real quick, a couple things before we start the show. Um, we have a, let's see who we have in here. I think I saw Pat Travellino in here. Um, actually... Uh, yeah, Pat is in here, but we'll let Pat do it next time. I'm 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 going to go with Grind Junior because she's my friend. You're my friend too, Pat, but I'm going with Grind. So, guys, real quick, we're going to give out on today's show a cash prize, but it has parameters to it. So, Grind Junior, I'm going to ask you, Pat Travellino, you're going to be my backup, okay? So, if for some reason Grind drops out of the show. You, you're the backup, but you guys are always here, so I anticipate you guys will be here. So, you guys are going to be looking in the chat occasionally. We're going to give out a $100 cash prize at the end of the show. I'm going to ask Grind Jr. to pick anybody she wants in the chat, and I'm going to give him a $100 cash prize. But here's what the $100 has to go to. The $100 cash prize will be for the person in the chat to spend $10 signing himself up for Patreon, find one of his friends to sign up for Patreon, give him the 10 bucks, you have $80 left. Both of you watch one of the shows on Patreon, meet up together, have a beer and an appetizer with the remaining $80. You both got 40 to get a beer or some kind of drink and an appetizer and talk about the show. Okay. So hundred bucks at the conclusion of the show, whoever grind junior or backup Pat Travellino um, selects 
I will cash app you $100 immediately at the conclusion of the show. Um, you have to have cash app. That's the only thing. If you don't have cash app, you got to set it up. Michael didn't know I was going to do this. He probably looks, what's he talking about? <laughs> I like it. I like it. I like it. Yeah, but one caveat. Can I add the caveat? Michael, you're the boss. No, I'm not the boss. No, I think I'm number three, I told you. <laughs> um, so it's you who's number three. Mikey and then me. That, that's <laughs> what I, I take it. Uh, if two people do hook up and have that beer or lunch or whatever, vodka, don't limit them to a beer. Come on. Uh, well, yeah. If they need a little bigger stipend, we'll, we'll, we'll supply them the, the extra resources. But yeah. take a little video and share it if you want. I'll even add another sweetener on it. If you guys take a picture or a video, or you, you send it into the show of you and your buddy together having a beer, okay? It's a trust system, so we're trusting you to do the right thing with it. Um, I'll send you some kind of surprise in the mail. I'm not going to say what it is yet, but you'll get some kind of something in the mail, and you will like what I send you, all right? I might have access to Michael's signature, so you might get something. <laughs> so there's a little sweetener for everybody. So Pat Travellino says, I can do that. So we got him as a backup here. So if I don't hear back from Grind, Pat, whoever asked the best question, at the end of the show, I'm going to ask you who asked the best question. You'll pop the name into the chat. I'll pop them up on the screen. I'll tell that person, send me your email of your cash app, and I'll send them the money immediately concluding the show. Oh, we have our friends here, the mob archaeologists. Hey, guys. If you guys want to pop in at all during at tours, um, after I ask Michael some questions, Michael, you're okay with that, right? Oh, I just got some. I, I won't disclose what I, he told me. That's why I was running a little late and get a chance to shave. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but Angel has something that's monumental, I think. And I won't even give a hint. I, I have something I would like to say, but I'll leave that to Angel if he so chooses to come on and disclose what he got his hands on. Really, really special. Wow. So, Angelo, I will drop a link in the chat when we start bringing, uh, as soon as I get done with a couple of things. All you have to do, I'm not sure if you ever joined a live show, all you have to do is click the link. It will bring you right onto the show. You'll just be on the screen with Michael and I. Ready, Michael? Well, you know what? We have a lot. Of, I never thought today, I thought it was just a, a giveaway day is that everybody will watch us on replay. Yeah. A lot of people in there. I'm stunned. Yeah, there's a, so far we got 130, and we just started the show. My man Sal has the bakery. He knows about the chichi flour, chickpea flour. He knows. He, he posted over there. It's good to have you on, Sal. Like everybody else out here, but I'm good. Glad to see Sal. Uh, he could talk us. He could give us a cooking show. Sal knows a bakery in in Canada, in Toronto area. Yeah. If you guys haven't watched the cooking, uh, or you or you don't know yet. Uh, we did release a cooking show today. Um, it's up on our channel now. Um, we did it by popular request. A lot of people saying, hey, make something, cook something. I asked everyone, got a lot of feedback. So uh, there it is. And it was good. I tried it. It was very good. <laughs> yeah, she's a great cook. Exceptional. Exceptional. Yeah. It was tough. As you know, you were here to get her to do it. So her <laughs> hands better than mine. She did a great job. It came out amazing. I never had it, never heard of it, and uh, but it was good. It was very good. Michael, I made a show a long time ago, and it was about the theory of cooperation. Long time ago, we bounced around this a, a discussion of, of this several times, but we never talked about it publicly. We brazed over it, glanced over it a couple of days ago. So I had a uh, question that I asked you on our very first show that we ever made on this channel. If you guys haven't watched it, it's our very first sit-down discussion that we did. And on that show, I said to you, Michael, you know, cooperating against John Gotti was probably the easiest thing that Sammy had to do out of all the other things that he was involved in, in that life. And you said, oh, <laughs> he's not gonna be happy with you saying that. And I know you disagree, 
with with my perspective on it. So I want to. So I was just reading through some things in Sammy's book. You see all the notes and stuff I have here, and I, I came across something that I found interesting that I want to read to you, and I want to get your response to it. So, and this isn't like an attack or anything; it's just kind of a theory, a perspective. Um, so my theory has long time been, and I'm not a street guy. I'm admitting that now. I have, I'm not a street guy. So I speak always as an outsider, not as an insider. Michael speaks as an insider. So my theory, Michael, has been, you know, in this life where at times you're ordered to kill your friends, um, you know, you know, go against people who you love, take an order that might be against something that's not in your interest, but someone else's interest. Um, and you're living in this long time life of criminality. Um, so if you take Sammy as an example, he was involved in murders with his, that included his friends and his family, okay? We know he had to kill, uh, he was part of the Paul Castellano hit. Paul was his boss. Paul made him, there's a rule against that. You can't whack a boss. That's the rule. But he did. Okay. Um, so we know that he was involved with murders with his friends and family, was behind a boss being killed, and he's lived a life of criminality. And I said to you, why would, if a guy can accomplish all of that, why would he have some type of compunction over taking a stand? So I was reading in Sammy's book. I'm reading directly from Sammy's book here. I want to read you one passage, and I want you to. I know you are going to disagree, but I want your perspective on this. So here we go. I really felt that I belonged to a brotherhood that had honor and respect. All the things I looked for in life was in good part of that oath. A lot later on, I got to learn that the whole thing was bullshit. I mean, we broke every rule in the book. Like at one of the trials, a lawyer asked me, how could you break the oath of Omerta? And I responded, there's a hundred rules. We broke 99 of them. This was the last rule. And I quote, it wasn't hard anymore to break in his oath. His last, it wasn't hard anymore. I said at the beginning of our show, that's probably the easiest thing Sammy did. You respond how you want to respond. Wow, you threw a real deep one on me. <laughs> so here's my question, essentially. Why would someone that had the history that we know Sammy has in the Gambino family, you can take him out of it or leave him in it. Why would a person with that history have compunction? over sitting on the stand and cooperating. That doesn't seem to me as an outsider as hard as having to kill my brother-in-law, having to kill my childhood friends. Okay. Well, first of all, Sammy didn't have history because I, I equate history with lineage. Sammy had, Sammy had from when he started, whatever the age he said he came around till he flips. Uh, November, uh, November 14th, 91 is when he flipped. I believe that was the day, if I get it right. Um, uh, so that's the first 302 he put out. So I think it's the first day he flipped. Very interesting, because I guess I'm wrong, right? I guess that Sammy would be be very hard for him. And, and his very hard for you. No, we talk, we're talking about him. Never mind yeah. here. Okay. All right, we're talking about his words. He says, what's the difference I broke the hundredth one? Yeah. And he says he had no problem doing it, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Well, hold this, on. Let's just make sure I quote him right. Yeah. He says, yes. He says, it wasn't hard anymore. Okay. So I guess the passion that he had for that life wasn't true. It was false. You can't because somebody talks about you, an individual, one individual. Are we correct? It's John Gotti when he heard those tapes. Yeah. There's 
almost a thousand guys that have made guys Jersey, New York, and all over the country. A thousand made guys. How could how could you really certify that by saying it don't matter anymore? You didn't take an oath to John Gotti. You didn't take the guy to pinch your finger, Tato. And Paul Castellano was the boss of the time. You didn't take an oath to them. We talked about this before. You took it to an entity, an ideology, something that goes back hundreds of years. You broke that rule. The rest of the rules equals rules are really not rules. They're policies. They're policies set in place. The only real pure rule is is Omerta. That's the real pure rule. They made a rule that's really a policy. You can't kill boss by paying a debt from the other families. It's a rule. You can't raise your hands to another member. It's a policy. You can't deal drugs. Another policy. Policy can be changed to deal drugs, not deal drugs, right? All over the world, they have different policies about dealing drugs and other infractions. So when they set up all these rules that, that are really policies, there's only one pure rule. And that's never to talk, because that's universal. That's a universal thing. That's what it was built on, this code of silence. So if it was that easy for Gravano to say that, he wasn't a true believer. Anybody who says that, I'm sure I'll get blowback because there's plenty of guys that cooperated. You know, you aren't a true believer. There's no way you can say it's acceptable once you get your finger pinched to say it's okay. I broke all other rules. What does that say about you? It's okay you broke all the rules? Are you justifying breaking all those rules? It's okay now? So now I'm going to break the last one. The first one to the last one. Everything else in the beginning is policies. And everybody breaks rules, let's say. We all break rules, right, in our life. Some die for it, some get promoted for it, right? John Sammy, Frankie DiCicco, Frank Castle, and the rest of the gang killed the boss without permission. They got promoted for it. And I want to talk about that another time, about that, what happened there. I have my own opinion on that. Uh, that was... I sat down with some old timers and uh, we discussed this, but uh, that's a whole other show. But you, you break in all these things and it's okay at the time because it's self-serving. When you say, and I've seen him many times say it and other people say it, I got an order to go do it. We get an order. I seen a, a thing the other day on Gravano. It was one of those, what do you call it? TikTok? TikTok. Hit my phone, I looked at it, he's talking about, when you get an order, you gotta go kill your brother. You gotta kill everybody, anybody. Well, that's a difference. He's right. I will I will concur. Only difference is that he was the one giving the orders. He was the one promoting, going to the boss, who had the boss's ear, who had enormous trust in the boss that the boss would trust him the same way back. And he has to kill those guys, not John Gotti. John Gotti didn't ask to kill those guys. So it wasn't that he, John, uh, Sammy was ordered by John or Paul or anybody else to go kill somebody. That's different. Johnny Keys, he was ordered to do that. But when you do it yourself, you take the initiative. You're the guy ordering it. And this is a nothing new. I already, I already talked about this. I says, I forgive the shooters, didn't I? Or the guys that went on the hit. Hard as it is to swallow, to accept. A lot of people say, I can never accept that. Well, you don't understand that life. You got to swallow a lot in that life. So when you give the orders or you're the antagonist that takes someone's life, it lays at your feet. So all this stuff about somebody else made me do it is nonsense. You don't break that rule. You don't break that rule over America. You just don't do it. 
Everything else is policy. That's a rule. That's the one standard, solid rule. And, you know, I, I would like to hear some feedback on this, on my position, by anybody. By anybody. I, I'd love to hear your opinions back. Especially the guys that did what I did. Justify. We can't justify. You lose your street creds. You lose being a gangster. Sammy still talks like a gangster. Sammy's the Don. The Don of what? The Don of what? What do you have? That's how I know he had no passion for that life. No matter what he said, I was disappointed. I was this, I was that. You were disappointed. What about the families you killed? <laughs> what about their families and the guys you killed? You're disappointed? Because John talked talk bad about you. Or anybody. It could be anybody. Anybody in this life. Myself. They broke me. Wrong. Wrong. Say it again. Not supposed to happen. I'll own that mistake. So there is no excuses. That's how this name came about here. I felt a passion for that name because I don't want to ever escape what I did with an excuse. If people are comfortable saying somebody else made me kill, sleep at night. I couldn't be. If I ordered it and blamed somebody else for telling me to kill them. So I hope that answers your question a little bit. I got a little passionate there because it really touches a lot of issues for me. Um, it, it, he's, a, he's a fraud. Because when it's self-serving, that you can break that oath, you didn't believe. John was just get out of free, jail free card. How are you going to get away with 19 being involved? 19 murders. And that's without anything else. He got absolved for 19 murders because he talked about one guy. Yeah, sure, he did other cases. He hurt a lot of other people, right? My opinion is the government did not care. They flipped it on the bus and they took down the Gotti name. And they did Gotti mystique. Your turn. Um, when you say, because this is going to be a controversial statement, so I want to push you on this one thing you just said. Man, stop pushing. I'm going to push. That's what I do. <laughs> Sammy gave the order. That's what you just said. Yeah. The, and, uh, you know, you talked to me before about, you know, the power of the boss's ear. We spoke about this also on Patreon. So when you say... Sammy was given the order because most of what you hear, especially from people who are um, more of an advocate for the Sammy theory, is Sammy wasn't the boss. John was the boss. John gives the order. So you're what you're you just said Sammy was given the order. So can you elaborate on what that means so there's complete clarity on what you mean? I understand what you mean because we talked privately about this at a different time, but for the viewer audience, I want you to kind of break that down. That's like anything else from going to the boss and getting permission for construction, uh, for any act of violence. If he's, Sammy's an administrative person, don't forget. Really trusted by John. And I told, I said in the last show, when you have the boss's ear, sometimes you're the boss. John wasn't the guy to go out and start sitting down with contractors. He didn't like it, and you could see it bleed, bled over in all those tapes. He felt like he was checking Sammy or Joe Piney and anybody else that came to him. But he's believing what Sammy's saying. That's why he's a little angry, a lot angry, not a little angry, on those tapes. Going back to what I said, when you have that ear and you put poison in it, the boss, of course, is the last stop for approval. But he trusts you. Sammy, Sammy killed his own guys. <laughs> he killed all the guys to take businesses. So when you're in that administrative position and you're that close to the boss that you took killed the boss and an underboss several years earlier, how, how could John not trust what he's saying 
at that time, through those years, from 86 till 89, uh, uh, end of November, which starts on those tapes. John had just about three years to just to digest everything and see these being played. So that's what I mean. I hope that clears it up. He's an administrative position. He's like this, one and the same with the boss. If Sammy says something to John, John may feel like, again, John's head for a minute, knowing John's personality a little bit. What if he kept going, Sammy kept going with John, this guy just said this, John, this guy's talking about you. Uh, Louis Molito was plotting with Paul and Tommy. Whatever the excuses are, uh, DB, Louis de Bona, Louis de Bona did this to me, he's robbing us again, robbing the family. And all these people just keep dying. Nicky Cowboy is a drug addict. Mike the Bat's a drug addict. Everybody's Everybody did something wrong. Who's he killing? He's going to John with it. John's now saying, hey, if I keep saying no to every murder, I may look like a punk. What John should have done was say, hold it up. I'll deal with this. Let's talk about this a little more. Let me dive into this. Even though it was on Sammy's guys he was killing, still belong to the family. They belong to John. So John's position, one of the mistakes, I really don't want to go here with this, but I'll say it. One of John's huge mistakes was not stopping this guy from pissing in his ear and killing people. So it's a little different getting an order. Yes, John okayed what Sammy brought to the table. That's the difference. Then Sammy coming to me, or Joe Watts coming to me, or anybody, all the other guys say, we got to do a piece of work. And you don't ask why. You're not supposed to. If they don't want to tell you, they tell you why. We say, we're going to kill that. Okay. What are, what are, what are I going to beat you? It's the way it goes. The, the shooters, right? The four shooters on that, on that, without all the other guys in the background. Isn't it told by Sammy that nobody knew the plot? Those guys did not, they knew that minute just before they went. If I'm not, if, am I mistaken? No, no, that's true. Okay. He said that the shooters found out just before the hit. Who? Well, they knew there was going to be a hit, but they didn't know who the target was. It didn't matter. That's my point. It didn't matter who it was. You take an order to go, you go. That's different than what in Sammy's position going to John where Sammy was. Hope that's clear. If not, we'll do it again. So I talked about this before, but for an outsider, it can be hard to understand some of these concepts. So I always try to break things down into more practical terms that the everyday working Joe could kind of understand the philosophy of what you're saying. So the example, when you said this to me, rang a bell in my head. So professionally in the business world, I rose to the presidency. I had a complete jurisdiction over the entire firm. I reported to one person, to the CEO, CEO slash owner. Um, every department head, every employee in the company, I had power over them. The CEO doesn't come down and he ain't talking to people at the entry level, operative employee level. He's not really interacting with the, man the, the middle management. That was all my job, to talk to the middle management who was filtering information down to guys below. But a, a guy at the, let's call him a soldier, a lower ranking guy, he don't have the boss's ear. If I wanted to abuse my power, I could go to the CEO and say, hey, this guy's stealing. Hey, this guy said this. The CEO put me in that position because he trusted me. Okay. If I tell you something, I, I'll go even further. If I'm going to my CEO who put me in a position of authority and power and I can't get the things I would like that I'm being tasked with keeping the, the, the business in order, I'm actually pissed at him. Why do you have me here if you don't trust me? Right. So he trusted me. I wasn't an abusive guy professionally, but anything I wanted, I just had to go to him. He would say, and I don't know if he ever told me no to something. You put me in that position so, so you're trusting my wisdom. All right, so now let me ask you, so I'll throw something back at you. You had assistant managers under you? Yeah. All right. Let's call them captains. Yep. Okay. 
What if some of those assistant managers, like a half a dozen of them, went to the real boss, the guy you checked in with, and said, hey, RJ's out of control. Let's ring a bell. <laughs> well, the captains of the family going to John around Sammy, ring a bell. So now that guy, your boss has got to take a different look at you. Say, what the hell's going on with RJ? Let me go talk to some other people to see in the family or in your in your business, in your company, to say, what's going on with RJ? And you start putting feelers out and you start asking. I say, yeah, RJ's out of control. You had absolute decision-making capacity. Gravano did. And that's why John got pissed off with him and Frankie Lowe to go see that concrete plant in New Jersey, whatever it was. Because they didn't check with him on that. He started to find out things. If he, if, if these other guys did not complain to him, probably would never have been an issue to him and Frankie Lowe went out there. But it, it was cumulative with the information John was finding out. So now, if you know, the people that are watching this on YouTube right now, you didn't hear the rest of the tape, the 12 12 tape. If you heard it, you'll understand where I'm going with it. Because uh, it really, it really gets opened up, and Frankie Lowe uh, opens up himself in that, in the rest of those tapes. And the, yeah, uh, the, was it six more, seven more? What was it? Uh, that night was seven complete tapes. It's, seven, it's about eight hours of, of recording we have. Uh, so we did one. You two people seen that. They didn't see the hit the other six. Yeah. Well, there's a total of eight we have out. One's out, so there's seven more available right now. Yeah. Right. Well, right. one's November 30th. Yes, one's November, but there's six more with the 1212 tapes. Yes. Okay. So if they heard that, they would understand a little bit more what I'm saying, where John's coming from, not where I'm coming from. What, what John's saying, I just expand on it to let people know this is what's in his mind as, I, as far as I could see. It's his words, not mine. So, yeah, it, you know, when you're in that position, you have the power of life and death. As a soldier, you have the power of life and death, right? You got to check in with your skipper. And your skipper, you have more and more, much more power than that soldier of life and death. And if you're in administration, administration, if Sammy asks for life or Joe Gallo asks for life or anybody in that, Frankie Lowe asks for life, John's going to say yeah. But when it gets one, two, five, seven, <laughs> where are we going? Bells are going up. What are we doing here? Killing all our own guys? <laughs> like Scarfo, like Gas Pipe, like the Columbos, like a lot of other people clipping their own guys, Lucchese guys. You know, they, they, what they did to that family, they killed, they killed Tusta for zero, zero. To get the Gambino guys, to get them mad at the Gambino guys to start a war, open war. So, uh, yeah, when you, what was Gas Pipe's position? What was his position? He's on the boss, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who was his closest guy? Vic. Go to Vic. Yeah, I want to kill that guy. Go ahead. Go kill him. It has to be a level of where you, ha you have to stop and say, what's going on? And John reached that point. So I was really surprised when you read me that passage back that it did not bother him. Of course, me, knowing Sammy at that time, I thought he was really upset by testifying. Maybe we, maybe he got off on testifying against John and everybody else. I don't know. Seems like it with that cop. If you, if, if you have no compunction about testifying, you got no pain. <laughs> it's like you got revenge now. Now you're getting even. I'm, I want to get up there. I want to. So with me, it, it was... I, I want to, I want to have a heart attack every time they told me I got to go testify. So I, maybe I die before I get on the stand. So that's the difference. Remember, I try to kill myself. He just really shocked me with what you read to me. That passage. He has no conscience about any of this. Any of this. Look, I'll go further. You're making me just divulge a lot of stuff here. If you could kill your best friends, who cares about a murder? If you could go to sleep every night until today, uh, 30 years later, 35, whatever, the first guy, friend of his, he killed. First relative he killed or whatever it was. You could go back, you could sleep every night. Well, well so you reach uh, everybody over here. What's the big deal? What's an oath? Let me get out, get out from under. On the tapes, John hates me. 
He may be looking to kill me. He talked bad about me. But he really talked bad about you, or is he saying the truth? That you're outed. He's compromising Frank Lucasio. So is Frank Lucasio mad at John at this point, or mad at Sammy? Mad at John, mad at Sammy. Uh, come on. Frank Lucasio wasn't mad at John at this point. I don't know about any point. Going by what he told Judge, Judge Glasser when they got sentenced. So, uh, like I said, this is, uh, I thought we were going to talk about cooking today. And you got me cooking. <laughs> Pot's boiling over. I didn't know, I never thought I was going to get this deep. I just wanted to read you. I mean, I didn't think it would get this involved, but okay. Um, but I agree with you. And that's why I took the position that I took when I said, it's hard for me to understand. I was never, when that, before I started working with you, the good thing about me, I got a complete straight line. Everything I think, everything I say, everything I do is in the same line with my work in this genre. You can go back before I started working with you. I was never this rat this, rat that, F that, F that, ever. I just tried to analyze these various different things. And I always ask this question. I used to ask this. What's worse, a guy that cooperates against his friends or a guy that kills his friends? And I think when you're trying to assess that, you're kind of playing the skinny kid at fat camp a little bit. That's me speaking as an outsider. I'm not a street guy. I'm talking as a legitimate guy that goes to work. I'm a father. I don't do nothing, Ill I don't do nothing illegal. So I was never, it was always hard for me to say this guy's so bad, but this guy's so good. I don't, it was, when I would see a guy who could do some of the things that Sammy did, my, just my logical mind would say, there's no way he was worried about Omer, how could that be hard to have? Or how can Omer to be hard when you lay next to your wife at night and say, "Baby, it's going to be okay. I'm going to find the killer. Are you okay, baby? Don't don't cry for your brother. I'm going to get him. Hug the mom and dad. Don't worry. If you can do that and carry that for 20 years or whatever it was, however long it was, five years, whatever, I don't know. Then I, it's hard for me to think that going on the stand is going to be but you shared something good about I me, mean, a good response. You talked about collateral damage. The people who didn't do nothing that come down as a result of this decision. So the last thing I guess I would ask you about this topic is, I know we kind of talked about it before. Can you explain a little bit for anyone who didn't hear it about the collateral damage piece of it? Yeah, well, Sammy seems to be the reason why he cooperated. And again, I don't watch all his videos, only when you or somebody tells me I need to watch it. Um, his excuse is John talked bad about, about him, right? The tapes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go back to that one person rule again. You throw away. Look, another thing. Those tapes were heard at the, at, at the bail hearing. When they got arraigned, they played tapes. They got discovered. This went almost a year before in November Sammy went in. They were arrested in December. With all these things, this F. Lee Bailey stuff we'll talk about that. I don't want to get into that. Blow, blow everything on one show. But uh, if somebody would have told me, boss or no boss, you're, you're just staying life for the in jail the rest of your life, in prison the rest of your life, and I'm going to go free, which I don't believe. F. Lee Bailey, uh, Ringling Brothers Circus could be there, any lawyer. I, I don't believe it. Now, John's not a rat. He's going to talk in front of a lawyer to Frank Lacasio and Sammy the Bull and say, I'm going to throw you under the bus and I'm going to walk out of here. Sammy should have punched him right in his fucking face. That's your boss? 
If he really said that, knock the shit out of him. Somebody told me that. I'm giving you up. You stay in prison. I'm, I'm going to get out of here, which is an impossibility. You listen to the tapes. Anybody, anybody listen to the tape, John's admitted to murders. He said, I killed him. You know why he's going to die? Because he didn't come in for me. So, I, you know, the, this is from the first moment when he, uh, Sammy heard those tapes. Why don't he go give John a beating? That would have been easy. Sammy was in tremendous shape at that time. Why don't he go just give him a lignada? Never happened. We didn't hear nothing in the street. Well, forget it. I was with his son every day, Junior. I was around his crew every day, which became mine after a while. So, I find a lot of this hard to believe. I know I told you I never read the book. You gave me that passage, and it really, it really stunned me that he, he made it that easy. Good for him. Maybe he's got no conscience. Switching a little bit. After cooking? No. <laughs> I want to ask you something about... I express it right now because I'm not hyped up enough. <laughs> um, disillusioned. When I... You and I discussed this over the phone recently. And... About and I talked to you about Sal Alvalino, Tony Ducks, when they're in the car talking and and he's saying, "Hey, would you bring your son into the life?" No, probably not, not the way. And then he says, "You know, if 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 our son was a if I was a lawyer, I wouldn't care if my son was a lawyer. I, I if my son if I was a doctor, I wouldn't care if my son was a doctor." And and then he says, "Well, that must mean oh, is what we're really saying that this life is a fuck is fucked up that this life is fucking bullshit if." Um, if we don't want it for our sons, um, and you can take a look back at a lot of, you know, you can look at, again, we talked about Sammy already, but his theory would be at, in time, you started to see the life differently for what it really was. I just mentioned Corallo and, Al, and Avellino. Right. Even Joe Bonanno kind of talked about how the life was totally different, changed, yeah. wasn't what it was. Luckily, because Luciano. Joe Bonanno got chased Arizona. He did. Road. He so, did. Of course, but, he you can find a, but you can find a host of guys. Michael Franzini. He just, bu- he just wanted to kill a bunch of bosses, Joe, right? He, what, what? <laughs> I did. I don't know. I'm just pushing. I'm going to ask the question. And even Chad. Oh, you give every individual, right? You can't paint every individual with a broad brush that says the life is no good. They have motives why the wife, what, yeah. the, the life is no good for them no more. It's all an excuse. They're bullshit. Every one of them has said that. I don't care who it, is, who it is. You don't know you're dealing with a bunch of criminals? You don't know you go kill your brother? Yeah, not literally your, your blood brother, but one of your brothers you kiss when you, if you get ordered? You don't know that? What, naivety? This is all nonsense. These are people that are scorned, like I told you in the marriage. These are people that something happened. somebody stepped on their toe and they didn't like being their toe stepped on. It hurts too much. It's nonsense. Now, he says about the life, he, it wasn't the same. It, 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 it degraded, like a lot of other guys said, right? Well, who was killing everybody? Who was taking business from everybody? Now the guy that wants out says it's not the same. You made it not the same. You made it ugly. You made, I told you, this is about the fourth time I'm going to say this. Thank God I got nothing. Sammy Watts. Every Tuesday night I went there until I was told to stop. Why would I say that? I looked up to the guy. I did work with the guy. He put me on a piece of work. Maybe two, maybe three. We had two other potentials, right? So, because you 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 fall out of favor, somebody talks about you. Oh, the life changed. You could go all the way back to the 1890, I think, where a guy flipped. In Italy, in Sicily. Maybe Angelo will come on and tell us who the guy is. He told me about it. The guy flipped. He says, the life's not the same. 1890? <laughs> what does it say? What happened over another 100 and change years? <laughs> you know what's funny? 
You know, some of the oldest recorded text is, I think, the Sumerian tablets. And if when those tablets are like interpreted, this is you talk about stuff that's thousands of years old. <laughs> There's there really isn't any time period in recorded human history, none, where the people that were the present time people were not saying. You know, this next generation of people, the fucking world's coming, it's going to come to an end. These new kids are this or that, they, they're lazy or this or that. That's not a, like, so like we're in this era today where everyone says these damn millennials, these damn Gen Zs, they're lazy, they don't want to work, da 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 da. I, I'm scared for the future. That's a perspective that has existed since the beginning of time. Present people can't understand the new thing that they weren't developing. It's a, it's a really common, it's a really common thing. But I guess, the, I guess my point I was trying to make is that it seems to be that time in the life reveals something that lack of time doesn't show. You come in, oh, it's the, like like you like John Jr. said, my father was proud like I was an all-American athlete. I heard, you know, you said it was one of the, you know, it was a, it was, a, it was a dream I wanted to accomplish since I was seven, since I was a boy. But then time in the life seems to disillusion people to a certain respect, to a certain extent. So that's kind of what my question to you is: what, what does, what is happening in that time that is changing people's perspective? If, if it changes people's perspective, well, it shouldn't. It shouldn't. I, I, let's we talk about Junior, right? When he stepped into life, who was his father? Okay. His father. Who's the boss? Little different than the guy who just gets straightened out and has no family lineage, no, nobody in the pecking order that they could be, have carte blanche and do whatever they want. That you know daddy's not going to Send uh, somebody to shoot you in the head, his blood son. A little different. You get all the, the his last name was Gotti, right? You go somewhere, that's that's a Gotti. Everybody knows Gotti. Doors open. Bigger than ever. I'm not saying he didn't deserve it in, in, the, in these ways. He didn't ask for it to be that way. But in the, his example, his father was the boss. So you got to rule him out. Of disillusion. If he gets disillusioned down the road, because his father's not going to be around no more, the man got sick and he got he got life. Well, would you think he's going to be there forever? You know, is that the disillusionment? Is that the disillusion that, in his case, and I told you, I seen his face when he came back from visits from for seeing his father. Now, is he didn't go see his the boss. He went to see his father. That's a good. That's a great point. That's a good point. You're not saying, hey, the boss. Is, how many people really care if the boss gets killed or not around or did life? The vacuum happens. Everybody moves up. It, it, you're dealing with just human nature, right? But he went to see his father. It broke his heart. I seen it in his face every time. Now he knew, like his father said, you know, they're going to come after you. They're not going to stop with cases. They're not going. We all know that life on the installment plan, right? They're not going to start with cases. He's seen his father, this is my opinion. He's seen his father suffer with cancer like an animal in a cage he couldn't get out of to help himself. And John probably said, I don't want to end up like this. I'm a Gotti. I'm his son. They have me down as the boss. They're going to put me in that cage just like my father one day. Is that disillusionment? Or did he come to his senses? That, uh-oh, I got all those kids running around. I'm going to be like my dad. I don't want to be like that. Now, does that make it right? No, you stepped on it. You're in. You put your toe in the water. You're in. So he caught a break. Whatever happened, he's living a great life. God bless him and his family. Uh, but it's it's... It's not the life. You're in it. Once you get that finger pinch, you're in it to the grave. So everything else don't count. When everybody's disillusioned, yeah, this guy said this, oh, yeah, they're doing this. Who cares? You know it. 
When you were doing it to people, it was okay. Gravano did to everybody. He ran over, he was steamroller. Everybody went to see Sammy. Sammy had something to offer. Sammy was a killer. Besides everything else, he commanded that respect. He got that respect. Not to fuck with him. But look what the power did. Now, mistake in the administration. You had, th you had three guys, John, Sammy, and after, I'm talking about after Frank was gone, and Frankie Lowe. You had three guys with reputations as serious guys who kill. You need a little oil in there. Somebody, you got to get a lot of old man like Joe Corey or somebody in there just to be able to say, hey, wait a minute. Can we talk about this? Like a Joe Gallo. Can we talk about this? John, we need to talk about this. I know what Sammy said. Can we talk about it? Can we call Louis de Bono? Give it to John. Do me a favor. Let me let me get, let me handle Louis de Bono. You know, let's take Louis Melito out of that crew. Let's put him in another regime. Let's see how he acts. DB? Oh, he's, he's talking about you. You would have told DB to go stand in the corner like that's that guy over there, this guy. Like that guy over there, he would have been standing there forever. He would have came out. He would have raised his hand to go to the bathroom. And I'm not disparaging DB as a man. I'm just saying he was no threat. That's that's my point. He would have stayed in that corner until you told him to dismissed. So th this is what you need. This is this is when you have a an administration that's all about, I'm not gonna let anybody think I'm weak and kill is the only option they know. John didn't kill his guys. He gave an okay to Sammy to kill his guys. Let that resonate with everybody. Wow, that's a statement there. Hmm. All right, let's talk about cooking again. All right. <laughs> Um, <laughs> last question for you. Okay. A common criticism I take, a criticism of me that I see sometimes, not, I don't say it's a lot, but I've, I've heard it enough that it's worth me asking you. So I've seen people say, you know, I like RJ, he's a nice guy, but I grew up around these people. These, you know, these, these were not good people. They were bad for our neighborhood, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, I get the, you know, RJ's glorifying these guys, you know, RJ, you know, if you were an insider, you have a little bit of a different perspective. If you were in this neighborhood, you would have a little bit different of a perspective. Um, so generally speaking, are they right? True or false? Am I, is it a, is it a lot different? You're not going to offend me. <laughs> But I'm going to ask you, are people, is there more bad or bad people in that life than good? I know there's some good ones, people who you really love, people who are beautiful to you, Anthony Sparrow. Let me, let me see if I can answer that. Okay. Are you say, are there bad people in that life? You mean Al Circle? Cosa Nostra? Uh -huh. uh, Al Circle and Cosa Nostra, you're talking about me, you want to opine on, is there be a bad people in the life? Or society's view as that group. You're outside in society. Mm -hmm. There's two different viewpoints of bad people. Okay. Absolutely. We have antisocial behavior. We have our own government. We don't call the cops. We kill when we feel like. We make moves. We make deals. We we we, we were underground doing, making uh, construction deals, Shylock and book make everything we could do to commit a crime, to make a few dollars, just about has been done, including pornography. So are we bad people to the outside? hundred percent. From inside, we kiss each other. We kiss the guy who had the pornography. We kiss the guy who had 90 murders plus. Uh, gas pipe, the, the mayos, they keep going. Yeah, it don't matter the name. You're in there. You're, you're not bad people. Yeah, are there bad people that we view? Like uh, Sammy once told me got you. later on, he said, Rod, uh, Roy DeMayo, he was a serial killer. And I go like this, look. <laughs> what was that? Look, what was that? <laughs> serial killer? <laughs> okay. 
Kettle, who's calling that kettle black? <laughs> I mean, uh, you got any mirrors in your house, Sam? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Jesus Christ is right. Uh, so, yeah, are we bad people? Yeah, absolutely. For society, of course, we're the dregs of society. Right? But inside, we're good people, tell ourselves. We, like I said. Now, somebody had asked me a question about. You know, if, if you were Sam and you heard those tapes, and it was a fair question, how would you react? There's two things. One, everything on that tape is a lie. Why is John talking about me like that? Yeah, you could get really angry. So this fucking guy's lying about everything. But that leads to what I said. Oh, I heard those tapes. Now, one of those things are true, John. What are you talking about? You and I got a problem. You we're going to fix this, you and I. The second thing is, oh, shit, I got caught. I did do all those things. Yeah, John was right. He figured it out. And he wants to be mad over it. So there's two ways to look at that. Hopefully that answers his question is that if I heard it and I did something wrong, uh-oh, hand the cookie jar. Right? If I didn't do anything, I judged. What do you mean? I, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I bought you all that money. What are you talking about? You got a piece of those companies. John, where are we, where are we going here? Right? John says, where are we going here? John, where are we going here? What's that bullshit about? You wanted to kill Louis Melito, not me. John. So there's two ways to do that. I can't answer for Sammy in that. But I'll, from my observation, listen to those tapes. I'm going to invite mob archaeologists onto the show. I'm, I just put the link in the chat. While he gets on, I want to ask you one last question. Biggest reward since being on YouTube? Oh, for me? Yeah. Oh. That's easy. Good. You know, it's something that I, I never could imagine the outpouring of support. Uh, I thought we were going to get really maybe 50 50 on this, 60% good or whatever. I never thought we would get this outpouring of support. Uh, I have a lot of people, legitimate people that say, uh, 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 my lifetime growing up have reached out to us, and not one, not 10, not a dozen, dozens. And the people that we don't know, many phone calls we made with people who have things going on in their lives that identified and want to hear some advice from us, whatever it may have been, just to talk. Uh, you get a reward out of that. You know, it, it, it seems like, you know, I, I come in and I talk a lot. Everybody knew me in the past. I never said a word to anybody about anything unless you needed to know. This is a far cry that, than the the other guy in the other life than where, where I stood. And everybody knows me out there knows that, no matter what they say, uh, uh, on the other hand, because I did what I did, then they would, they're going to disparage you, and they have a, every right to. But the people who really know me, they know I'm telling the truth. I never talked about anything to anybody unless they needed to know. So with the people that come on here, known and unknown in the past, it, it's, it's really fulfilling. It really has. It filled a big void to know that I, you know, uh, before I, I really didn't like myself. It gives you a little reward back to say you, you, there, there is an importance there. There is, there's a role for you to, uh, to fulfill at this time. Like I said, we had a call the other day. It was a, a really heartfelt call with somebody. And um, don't mention the name, of course. We keep everybody's name private and their situation's private unless they want to air it out. Um, and it was uh, something I think we needed to do, and we were so happy to do it. And there's many on here like that. They're finding peace with us. And our, our reward is whatever we could give them in advice and, uh, and direction. How's that surprise show for you, Michael? I never thought it was going to get that deep. <laughs> you keep saying that, but you keep giving me deep questions. What do you think? I'm just going to give a one-liner? Well, I... 
Man. Well, <laughs> well, it was a great show. It was a fantastic show. I'm glad we did it. Um, I talked to you about this by phone one day about that quote, and you, I, I can always tell when I got some juice to squeeze out, <laughs> you know, some juice to squeeze. And you said on our last show, if you put if you you pitch me a fast. <laughs> No, was that what you said about the batter's box? Or the, right. um, I'm <laughs> so you got so passionate over the phone. I said, got an idea for a great show. <laughs> so this wasn't a fastball when you threw me. Today. It was a curveball. Okay, well, there we go. So, guys, let me tell you guys a little. Can you see me, Michael? Oh yeah. Okay, internet problem. Okay, Michael's best, the best Michael. Is when he don't know what's coming. I don't know how to explain it to you. We've done well, one or two shows where we talked about him in advance, but the ones when he doesn't know what's happening, those are always the good ones. <laughs> so, um, so guys, thank you for being a part of the show. We got a. I did not expect to get four hundred people in the live chat um, <laughs> when we didn't even put much marketing out for the show. We didn't really promote it. Um, you guys are such a supportive, so supportive to Michael. Um, Michael's my brother. I love Michael. I say that all the time. And I say it that same way. Michael's my brother. I love Michael. But I'm so glad you guys are supportive of Michael. I don't have to have no wrenches, no moderators, nothing. You guys have embraced our channel. You guys leave great comments. You guys have been very supportive on our Patreon side of it. Um, so we'll keep doing the same thing. We don't have so, any type of uh, formula here. No. Me and Michael really are friends. He gets mad at me sometimes. Um, so we have real conversations. So he really is my friend. He, he knows my family. I know his family. So um, he's really my friend. So what you see on the show is real. Um, and the only formula for our type of show, if anyone wants to recreate it, you got to be friends and you got to be honest. Got those two things, you'll be okay. Close it out, Michael. Okay. What I wanted to suggest also, maybe is that we have we put up a lot of pictures that have nothing to do with uh, this this uh, genre and uh, wartime pitches cooking. We could do a show on all these pitches, uh, and I think it would be pretty interesting because people are interested in recipes and stuff like that. Um, and and just talking out of this uh, out of this circle, uh, this subject. I think uh, maybe we could do something down the road without without talking about mob stuff and make make some fun out of this uh, a little bit more. I try to have as much fun as I can in here until you put me serious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I love to talk about the pictures. You got a lot of comments, and uh, maybe we could do another live with YouTube and Patreon like we did today. Uh, we didn't forget about the YouTube people, uh, not at all. So stay tuned. We'll be here. Uh, the Patreon people are, uh, we named them the Patreonese family, uh, our Patreon people. It's a play off the word Patreon. So uh, we have a, uh, a, good, a great group on there. Uh, and, and people just want to have fun. And they all ask a lot of quality questions and enjoy what we put up there. A lot of the pictures you don't see on YouTube, you will see in there. Uh, we have some really good stuff. A lot of people on here on YouTube and on, on Patreon have donated a lot of pictures and stories. Yeah. Uh, and we want them to share their story. Everyone to come on and talk about their family going way back 50, 80, 100 years. Some people on here that we have, uh, we're here. We're here to embrace it. So I want to thank you. Someone just said the Scars Cookbook. Guys, I'm writing a book. I got access to a major publisher. I asked Michael to consider doing a cookbook. Michael's wife's the best cook. One, if, if not the number one best cook I've ever eaten from, she's in the top two, let's say, right? So um, I think they should consider putting together a little cookbook. And if they do it, I'll help them. I will help them publish it. Now, the cooking show was by popular demand. I asked the same question. Do you guys want a, cook show, a, a cooking show? And I got good feedback. Make the cooking show. Make the cooking show. So I flew out to Michael, took my camera, shot the cooking show, put it out. You guys got to petition the cookbook 
I'll get it published if Michael wants to work with me on it. So thank you for that little suggestion. <laughs> yeah. Michael, talk about the uh, the uh, cooking show. Tell them something about the cooking show we just put out. Oh, well, yeah. It's a, it's a Sicilian dish called panelli. Who don't know? It's a chickpea flour that's like pulverized, like regular flour. And you make it with a mix. And uh, we could put the recipe on here also. If they don't see the show, it's on... Is it on YouTube, the show also? Yeah, it's on YouTube and Patreon. There's a recipe, there's a recipe in there. And uh, I like to do put different dishes that nobody really cooks uh, out in the world. We, I have some other ideas that we could do something uh, that's uh, pretty unique. Like, outside of Sicilian Italian culture, uh, you really don't see it in restaurants at all. Uh, very few places in New York still make panelli. Uh, you really got to go to a place called like a focaccia. Or they make them. So uh, this is something that uh, is unique. It was a peasant dish, very very cheap to make, piece of bread and uh, and chi chickpea flour with some ricotta. Those are peasant dishes. Now today delicacies. So guys, check it out. It's only a ten minute show. It was fun. We had a, we had a lot of fun. And I gotta be honest, when we started this channel michael's whole philosophy was i want to go a different angle i don't want to be sitting in a dark room all black looking like a maniac i just want to do i want to show different sides of it so when you see this little blue banner in the background it's the reason it matches michael's shirt right now because his favorite color is blue um you know we put pictures up of things that like you know we talk about good things on this show we don't talk about bodies being buried in nonsense all day so um, you see, we put out, like he did a, a performance from his home with a guy singing a song called Miko Mio. That song was written. Uh, I mean, that, that song was performed at Michael's house. It was important to him. I wish I would have had it. It would have came out live. I messed up the recording. He wanted to, he wanted it to be a live broadcast for you. So when you see little things like guys singing in his house, the cooking show we just put out you know, talking about animals and different, you know, so things like that. Um, seeing photographs of his grandfather, you know, bringing his son onto the show. Um, that was a something that we had talked about early on before we started the show. It was more, this show had something authentic and genuine that we wanted to do. Um, and there'll be a lot more of that type of stuff to come. Um, so this channel, what Michael told me when we started it, I want this channel to be like a resource center of the history. Um, if we, uh, he didn't want to block anybody. He wanted to accept all opinions. He wanted to, you know, I don't, Michael's never called me and said, block anybody. So if you're blocked, I blocked you. <laughs> okay. So Michael wanted to have a resource center channel where when you come here, it can direct you into many different play, uh, places to get information. So if yeah. you look on our belt section, we have the Mob Archaeologist. We have the Black Hand Forum. We have great books that you can buy and purchase. We have charts up there. Um, you know, Coastal Ocean uh, News. Coastal Coast Ocean News. Ed Scott. The Black Hand, for the Black Hand, Black Hand prints. Very good. They got great info on that. Exactly. So even the Mob Archaeologist channel was a Michael-endorsed, sponsored, promoted channel. I was on those phone calls with him pushing these guys to take this, put this history out, make an authentic resource place for history. So he named that group, the Mob Archaeologists. Um, so that's why we appeared on their show. So this is a place where we want to create a Cosa Nostra History Resource Center. So our community board is not by accident. It's a, all those pictures and all that information is up there for a reason. Close it out, Michael. Thank you. Thank you for hearing us out. And I uh, hope you all enjoyed this. And uh, any feedback, we want the feedback. Whether it's good, bad. So let's have some fun with this. Good night. God bless you.